All right, it is the, what is today? The 29th of July, 2021. And we'll give a few minutes here for folks to get on. Um, uh, well, welcome everyone to our uh, broadcast tonight. And uh, I also want to say it's good to be back home. I was in Wichita, Kansas, uh, Brother Green's church last weekend. Missed the service here, but got good reports. So I'm glad for um, let's see here what this says. First Gospel Church will share that. All right. Um, Anyway, like I said, it's good to be home. And um, since we were gone last weekend to the Wichita Assembly and and uh, appreciate the good reports we got of the service here and uh, looking forward to service Sunday. I know that the, you know, I'm well aware that the, you know, COVID outbreak with the new variant is uh, spiked and is up. And therefore, we will put off indefinitely our midweek Wednesday night service until things slow down concerning COVID. And I'm sure you all know that. Um, uh, I have asked for all of the Sunday morning breakfast folks to go back to wearing masks. Everyone is serving and on breakfast teams to wear masks. And then I'm um, leaving the mask up to individuals but I am asking you to space and therefore, you know, uh, try to set, you know, maybe space a pew between pews. And of course, family members and people that's been together all the time can certainly set together on the, on that particular pew. But we do want to be careful uh, right now. Uh, it seems that this new variant Delta is more contagious uh, thank the Lord that we haven't been affected by it yet, but, uh, you know, but we're certainly don't count ourselves to be exempt. And therefore, we want to be wise and be careful. And we want to consider others and make sure that it's not others that we're, or not ourselves only that we're protecting, but our brothers and our sisters also. Uh, we'll mention that... Um, Brother Goss in Keswick, Canada is back in the hospital. Uh, he's just, you know, too unstable at home right now. So they took him back to the hospital. So we'd like to keep, like for everyone to keep him in, um, you know, in prayer. Keep praying for the family and the church there. They're not having regular services in the church at this time, just, uh, Zoom meetings. Uh, I would like to get some feedback. I'm really considering changing our Thursday nights to a Zoom meeting. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe Brother Painter can let me know, but I'm not sure if we can, well, I am almost sure that we can post any Zoom meeting to our uh, YouTube page. I just, uh, I think I'd like to get away from Facebook altogether. Uh, but we do have a, a YouTube page, which is FGCLR. Those words, for anyone that doesn't know, those letters stands for First Gospel Church, Little Rock, FGCLR, dot media, where dot com is our website, but dot media is our, U our YouTube page. And Everything that we do is on a, is posted on, in chronological order on YouTube, on that YouTube page. So you can be aware that uh, we do have that page and you can go there. And if we could have our meetings Zoom, I, you know, we have Zoom meetings in the Dominican Republic every Monday night. And it just seems to be more of a togetherness or closer because everyone can see everybody. And, uh, you know, if let's just say that 
you know, for whatever reason you weren't feeling well and you was in your pajamas or something, you don't have to turn your video on, but you can see everyone, most everyone. Uh, I wouldn't want you dressing appropriately. You don't have to wear a suit or a shirt and tie like I do, but, um, you know, I think it is appropriate for ministers to to appear as ministers before God's people. And, uh, you know, so I, I, everyone doesn't have to dress. I would just say dress casual, but uh, appropriately. Uh, all right. So anyway, I just want to welcome everyone here tonight. I'm glad you're uh, here with us. And um, I don't know if you've looked in, looked at our um, uh, you know the, the the I don't know what you call that the notes or details about the meeting or broadcast tonight I uh, I'm not sure I don't think I, I can't do this I don't think I can uh, I don't think it's possible for me to screen share let me look and see um, maybe if I can, somebody would get on here and tell me that I can screen share. And I'm not sure. I know I can on Zoom. But in screen sharing, you would be able to see my Bible. And you'd be able to follow what I'm going to do on the Bible. I'd really like to be able to do that if that's possible. Um, does anybody on here know Sister Reva told me at one point that screen sharing was possible but let me see what this does oh we've already got 25 viewers up but see I only see like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 6, 7 of them so I don't get to see everybody unless, can you click on that? No. Mm. Let me see what this does. No. Here's 27 viewers, 23 peak viewers. Um, sorry if I'm you know, I do like um, um, oh no. Let me see how I change this. <laughs> I've, I've done something that I don't know how to change here. Just a minute. Um, Hmm. Let me see if I can move this. No, I can't. I don't know what you're able to see either. So, let me see. Um. What I've done here, I'm sorry, folks, but I've, I've clicked on a button that shows a whole page. It's got a little bitty deal. Somebody, uh, there's no way I can see what you're doing that I can see. Um, I've got a little bitty screen of me, but I've got a, you know, a whole page that's telling me how many viewers, how many peak viewers, total reactions, which says two, but I can't, I can't read any of that. I can't click on anything that's on this page that I can see. Um, let's see what questions, I can see questions. Somebody ask a question. Live video details, stream setup. Let's see what that does. Okay, that put me back there. 
Anyway, I still can't see anybody that is on on with me. So, you know, maybe somebody can text my phone or something. I don't know. But I would really love to be able to screen share with uh, what I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it's just family. So I'm thinking y'all can bear with me just a little bit here. Uh, somebody texted me. Hold on. It shows you broadcast is paused, but we can still hear you. We can't comment any longer. Can you see me now? Because I, now I've got my picture back up, but um, now it's back for us. Okay. Sister Reva, do you know how I can screen share? Can you text me that? don't know how it works on a Mac. Okay. Well, okay. So we'll just do it tonight. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm, I worked on this today and since it's fresh in my mind, I thought I would give it to you. I'm going to give you a, my introduction to the book of revelations, which covers quite a bit of material. And then I, I hope to cover the first verse, the first chapter. So, um, without any further ado, I'll, I'll, um, do that. And I've wrote quite an article concerning the date of the book of Revelation. I think it's very important to understand when it was dated. And I'll explain to you why. Um, number one, the, there's two dates and most of the theological world hold to the Catholic date, which is that it was written sometime around AD 95 or 96. I'm going to read to you why I have a problem with that. <clears throat> um, number one, maybe I can just, maybe I can tell you this more, maybe rather than read it. Um, if it was written in AD 95 or 96, then Domitian Caesar, Caesar, mm -hmm. the Roman Caesar, whose name is Domitian. Let's see, I got a text here, so let's see. How to screen share on your Facebook Live on YouTube. Well, I don't have time to do that right now. You watch it and tell me how to do it. Uh, or maybe I'll do it next time. But let me go back here. The Roman emperor, which was Caesar, in AD 95 and 96 was Domitian. He was very cruel to the Christians and um, was against the body of Christ. Uh, prior to him was Herod, who was the, the uh, uh, Herod was the uh, Um, he was the Caesar at the time before AD 70. He was, he was Caesar. Uh, he died in, in AD 68, two years before the, before AD 70, the destruction of the temple. Well, um, here, here is an issue. Uh, number one, history shows that John, the Apostle John, who wrote this, was, uh, he left Patmos. He was exiled to Patmos. And he left Patmos uh, in the end of his life and went to uh, Ephesus and 
spent the rest of his life there as the, uh, you know, that was his home church. And so he was Ephesus, at Ephesus until he died. Well, if he was exiled by, uh, by uh, Herod, then um, the law in, uh, in uh, Rome was is that an emperor could exile anyone to a city. And obviously the reason that they would want to uh, exile John is to shut him up so he wouldn't be able to preach the gospel anywhere other than just that area. And so he was exiled to the island of Patmos. It was a very uh, populated, affluent island. <clears throat> uh, and he could live there, but if he left there, he would be, the emperor would kill him. Uh, but when the emperor dies, whoever's exiled by an emperor, when that emperor dies, that person is free. And that makes sense that John would be free after AD 68 and go to, go to Ephesus. Now let me address a little bit more. The way the date of AD 95 and 96 was determined. Number one, I want you to know this, that I have researched and I can't find anything that was important concerning the church that happened in any time in the AD 90s during that 10 year period. Uh, the church had fell away by then. There wasn't anything going on. Uh, the judgment of Israel had taken place. And uh, so the dark ages of the Gentiles had set in at the falling away of the church. So it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that that would be the date of the writing of, of the book of, plus if it was in AD 95 from AD 70 and John was a young man when God, when the Lord called him, but he's no doubt somewhere close to the age of 30 by the time the Lord died uh, in AD 33, that would put him, you know, a hundred years old at, at that age when he got this. Well, I don't know when they would have showed he had died but he would have been more, you know, like in AD 70, he would have been more like, uh, what, late 60s, 70 years old, which makes somewhat sense to me. Anyway, let me get back to how the date was determined. There was a, a man by the name of uh, Irenaeus, he was the second bishop of Lyon, uh, and his time frame was from A.D. 140 to 202. And he was he he made several writings concerning the church, and then there was another church historian by the name of Eusebius, who uh, the, he studied Irenaeus's writings, and. He, um, from his writings, he determined that it must have been around AD 95 or 96. And he got out of those writings some way he determined that, that Irenaeus got this from Polycarp, who was the bishop over, over Ephesus. And um, so um, that's how it was determined. Now, let me let me say here's what he. I'm going to read to you what what uh, Irenaeus wrote that Eusebius uh, had read and got made his decision from. It says Irenaeus said this. We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist, for if it were necessary that his name should be distinctly revealed in this present time, it would have been announced by him who beheld the apocalyptic vision, which was John. For that was seen not very long time since, but almost in our day toward the end of Domitian's reign. I don't know how he come up with that because uh, this was in AD 325 
and uh, uh, Eusebius, I mean, this was a span from these three men, Polycarp, Arrhenius, and Eusebius, over 300 years or three decades. So it's a little bit hard to understand. Let me go ahead and read here. It says, the, there are things about this statement that need to be noted. First, Irenaeus did not witness this. He supposedly obtained this from Polycarp. Secondly, the key part for that was seen not very long time since is ambiguous. According to Irenaeus, that or it was sometime in AD 95 or 96 during the last part of the Domitian reign. Thirdly, we don't know if the Antichrist or the Revelation or John himself, it, we don't know if he meant that it was a book that was written or, or John or the Apocalypse. We don't know what he's referring to. Uh, furthermore, it comes to us through the supposed statements of three people. As I stated, Polycarp, Arrhenius, and Eusebius, separated by these three centuries or 300 years. Uh, to me, it's a little bit uh, amazing that this statement, even with all its uncertainty, is the only evidence that's used to support the late date theory that it was written in AD approximately, or that's thought it was written in AD 95 or 96. It's been accepted by generations of people for years without really questioning or examining it in the light of the book itself. The late date has passed, has been passed on to us the same way it was passed on to Eusebius by the word of mouth and handed down through the tradition of the Catholic Church. Another statement by Arrhenius, however, seems to indicate maybe it was the early date. In his fifth book, he speaks as concerning the apocalypse of John and the number of the name of the Antichrist as follows. As these things are so, and this number is found in all the approved and ancient copies, Domitian's reign was almost in, in Irenaeus's day, but now he speaks of the revelation being written as ancient copies. His statement at least gives some doubt as to the vision being seen in AD 95, which was almost in his day. And it even suggests the time somewhat removed from him to consider the copies available to him as ancient. All right, so to those who hold the early date, and I'll, I'm going to explain in a minute why I think the date's important. Those who hold to the early date feel it's much more likely that John wrote the Revelation prior to AD 70, during Nero's reign, from AD 54 to AD 68. Their position was that the most reasonable, that it is most reasonable that the coming destruction of AD 70 was the reason that the letters of the seven churches were being written, giving them urgent instruction, edification, and admonishment and that the, that the destruction of A.D. 70 was the things which must shortly come to pass in Revelations 1.1, 1, 1, and what was referred to by the statement, the time is at hand in Revelations 1.3. I'll, I'll go over that when we go over the chapter. Revelations 4.1, the angel tells John that he's going to show what must be hereafter. Therefore, the first three chapters address what shortly, uh, what what time was at hand, and uh, let's see, what must shortly come to pass, and what time was at hand, as being the destruction of AD 70, and chapter 4 through chapter 22 address the future covering, uh, uh, the future covering the 2000 period of the Gentile world. After consideration that gives strength to the position for the early date is, history tells us that the Apostle John, as I said, was freed from being exiled to Patmos and then went to Ephesus and later died there. 
as I explained, the Roman law freed him when Nero died in AD 68. So uh, then I think it's I think it's important to at least state that there is more than one theory as to the fulfillment of the book of Revelation. One theory is that it was, was all fulfilled prior to AD 70. Another theory is, is it was to be fulfilled in the future from the time it was written. Of course, you saints know that my position is that it was written prior to the destruction of AD 70 and that the purpose of writing to the seven churches of Asia was to prepare them for the destruction and final judgment upon the Jews, Jewish world. Chapters one through three, the letter to the seven churches. Surely God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his prophets, his servants, the prophets, Amos three and seven. Chapters four through chapter 22 is the revelation of prophecy for the church and the future of the Gentile world. So the reason I think that the date is very important is because number one, <coughs> Even though I can explain it, if the date were the late date, but it makes more sense since there was a promise to the overcomers in the seven churches in the letter written to them prior to AD 70, the final judgment on the Jewish world. Uh, and then the church fell away. And so you'd be looking at 25 years after the church fell away that people are still given a promise that they can make a bride uh, as overcomers and rule and reign with Christ a thousand years. That's not as reasonable as understanding that it was urgent, that they were, they were uh, warned and let know that the time was at hand and that there was something that was shortly to come, which was AD 70, that they needed, there was still a sevenfold light. There was still a candlestick in those churches and they needed to heed uh, the time because just like in Noah, Noah's day, the, the, the door to the boat was shut. And I would say the the door to overcoming would be shut, shut when the church fell away. So I think, that's why I think it's important to understand the dating was prior to AD 70. In fact, it makes far more sense to me. Uh, and you've heard me many times that for those that possibly are not, uh, uh, have, you know, not been under my ministry, have heard me on these things a lot. Uh, that there was in the last days of the Jewish world and after its harvest, the apostles began to pass off the scene and afterward, after the church fell away, the gospel was given to the Gentiles uh, as the church was falling away. God turned from the Jews after he got everyone out of the Jewish um uh, religion and brought him into the body of Christ and those that rejected him, he finally turned away from and turned to the Gentiles. And so uh, uh, but the Gentiles, as you've heard me say, couldn't receive it on the same level. It's very important to understand that the church, the early church fell away from the Jewish religion which had been in effect for 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. And so now uh, when the gospel was turned to the Gentiles, remember Paul said that the law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. Well, the, Jew, the Gentiles didn't have that. They didn't have God. We, we didn't have God dealing with us. Now we can say God's dealing with, been dealing with us almost 2,000 years and we're nearing a restored church setting, but we're not there yet. But uh, but when it first started way back there, I'm sure there were a few people like Cornelius's household, 
which was a proselyte to the Jews. Timothy, one of Paul's right-hand men, was, was half Greek, not full-blood Jew. I'm sure there were several of those first uh, Gentiles that came in that was able to get into that early reaping of the Jewish world. But for the most part, as, as Gentiles came in, there just wasn't enough time for them to be able to embrace this message and go through the process of overcoming sin before AD 70 and before the church fell away. That's why I think it's important to understand the dating of this. And uh, now let's look at Revelations, the first chapter. I'm going to, I'm going to go through that first chapter. I, uh, what I did today is I recorded this on Zoom. Anyone who wants to be able to see the scriptures and hear me explain it on Zoom, if you've got Zoom, if you will text me and tell me you want it, I will text you that recording. And it's exactly what I just told. The introduction to the book of Revelation it has a little more to it than what I just mentioned. And me reading and explaining the first chapter. So if you would like that recording, I have it and I'm going to do each chapter that way and have a recording on the entire book. What's neat about it, you can see a small video of me talking and hear me talking. You can see though the cursor. You can see my computer screen with my Bible program on the entire computer screen and you can even watch my cursor as I read the scriptures and explain them. So I think that's going to be a good a, a good uh, tool for people to have with, that I'm you know I'm putting it together. And so I thought I'd just go it over with y'all tonight, and uh, I suppose uses a, a sounding board. Uh, I'm still looking for some way to figure out how to get back to the place where I can see, um, see what this does. No. Where I can see who's on here. That's what I'd like to be able to see. There it is. There's all the notifications. Okay. I can see everybody on here now. All right, God bless your hearts. Wow. I think that's all my notifications, but anyway. Um, all right, I'm going to go over the first chapter with you. We're going to start in the very first chapter, in the first verse, if you'd like to follow on your phone, tablet, or your, you know, your Olive Tree Bible app, or your Bible itself. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave the, unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. I'm going to stop right there and explain what I've read in these three verses. In verse 1, number 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, his Father, gave to him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And, um, And so he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay, what was shortly to come to pass? Well, I, I would have to say it was A.D. 70. As I said earlier, there was nothing in A.D. 95 or 96 or any of the 90s that we know of or if there's any record of that was shortly going to come to pass. In fact, nothing came to pass shortly during the Dark Ages for many years. Uh, so I think that lends to the uh, fact that the writing was, it's far more reasonable to believe the writing was 
prior to AD 70 and prior to Herod's death in AD 68 because Herod's death would have freed John and I doubt that he would have stayed there, but he was there when the spirit gave him this message. So it could have happened in AD 68 prior to Herod's death, but when Herod died, uh, John was free and left and went to Ephesus and died there later, spent the rest of his life there. So what shortly must come to pass was AD 70. God, there were, that, that God didn't do this at any other time during the New Testament, but there was something so important that God had Jesus send an angel and tell John about this and have him write these seven letters. And not only these seven letters, but the whole, uh, the whole book itself, the whole revelation or apocalypse. I want to say something about that. Um, verse three said, blessed he is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. What time is at hand? Well, obviously it's it was time to, to notify the seven churches and to admonish or warn them, to correct them, to uh, encourage them and uh, to go over the things that God wanted corrected if they were going to uh, remain having the seven golden candlestick light, sevenfold light of God. Uh, God told them, if you don't do these things, I'm gonna remove your candlestick. So <clears throat> uh, the something was urgent that 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 they had to accomplish what God wanted to accomplish among them uh, or they would lose their candlestick or the, the, the full manifestation of God because judgment was going to come on that world and was going to, uh, the lights were going to go out. Uh, God's, God's manifestation for that world was finished, was going to be finished. And then he would start all over with a new world of the Gentiles. Also, it was time that God reveal the book of Revelation, that God would show the prophecy of the future of the Gentile world. Uh, he only had one living apostle that had enough understanding that could have even probably written this, understanding the symbols and all of it, and been able to put it together like he was able to do. Um, so uh, it was time. It was time for the, the book of Revelation to be written, even though a big part of it was sealed. It was a sealed book, uh, which it starts off in the fourth chapter or fifth chapter showing us that it was sealed. But the Lord is the one that revealed it uh, he gave the revelation of it, but you still have to get in a spiritual condition. And no doubt the spirit of God has to reveal to his ministry. Uh, and so it was been years that no one really understood the book of Revelation. It's, I remember when I was just a young man and brother uh, C.T. Gray's church in San Antonio, Texas, he had me teach the um, the adult Bible class on Sunday mornings. And when when we got to the book of Revelations, well, I was just, you know, it was just like reading Greek almost to me. And what I did was I studied Gordon Lindsay. Gordon Lindsay back in those days, and the this was back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, that Gordon Lindsay um, he at that time was thought to have known more about the book of Revelation than anyone else. And so I studied and read his teachings and that's what I taught. And I can tell you, I don't remember all of it today exactly, but I can tell you it's a far cry from what I see today and know about the book of Revelations. So God has revealed so much more. And I want to stop right here and say something. I don't, I don't pretend 
to have the final answer on everything in the book of Revelations. But I wouldn't be, it would be less than honest of me if I told you that, you know, I don't know any more than anybody else knows. I am absolutely sure. If one thing I'm sure of is that God has been dealing with me about the book of Revelation for approximately 30 years now. God, back when this first started, and I didn't never have any inclination, nor did I have a desire to be able to look into this book or explain it or anything like that. I'm, I'm not one of these bookworms that, you know, just digs in and studies everything and learns everything. You know, God works with me different than that. And, uh, but I've learned, I've learned how my gift works and how God deals with me. And I know when God's dealing with me. Uh, it took me years to learn that, but I today I know it doesn't take God very long to deal with me about something that I know it's God. And uh, the Word of God is one thing that I'm I feel certain about that when what God has dealt with me about, I know that it was God. And then I know there's times that I'm looking at something, but I don't know the answer to it. And I don't have an answer. A lot of times I'm saying, God, I wish you'd show me this. I wish you would reveal this to me. Sometimes he does. But in the book of Revelation, when God first started dealing with me, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and uh, I'd, you know, there'd just be certain parts of it that this brotherhood taught. And let me say something about that. Uh, from Brother William Souders forward, uh, we've had a certain understanding of the book of Revelation. I I don't want to de, 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 you know, how, make it sound lower than what it is or what it was, um, but I have referred to it as a pig trail through the book of Revelations. Um, we haven't known the seven letters altogether. Some of the brethren in the body taught it as church ages. Other men taught it as literal seven churches back there. And, and those that teach church, church ages will agree to that, but they think it meant showing that each one of these churches represented a church age. I don't agree with that, but I, I, it's okay to apply it that way, I think, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. I think there were literally seven churches and there were many more churches in Asia. And those churches that were the letters were written to, remember, they got the whole book and all seven letters was in the scrolls of it. So they got to read one another's letters and whatever applied to one, no doubt applied to the other and to the other churches. I would say these churches were, at the time it was written, was the, you might say, mother churches or pillar churches they were in the initial route going into Southeast Asia from the Aegean Sea. And uh, I, Patmos, by the way, was out in the Aegean Sea in a, an island before you had to take a boat to get into Ephesus and, and these other six churches. They were all in main routes going into Southeast Asia and so they were predominant churches. And from there, no doubt, those letters went out to all of Paul's churches throughout Southeast Asia. And so seven, you know, is the number of complete, completeness or per perfection, the perfect instructions and corrections, admonishment of God was given to those seven churches and those other churches that were in fellowship in the body of Christ among the Gentiles at that time. And so it was time for God to not only give those seven churches these, these letters, but also in chapter four. I'm going to go to chapter four and just briefly, I'm going to read you the first verse because uh, the things that will shortly come to pass and part of what was the time at hand was A.D. 70, 
that applied to the seven churches of Asia. And so I would say, in fact, part of my not writing or recording this prior to now is for that very reason, because um, I couldn't figure out how to fit the seven churches, those letters, in with the rest of the book of Revelation, because the message of those letters was to them in particular back there. Then from the fourth chapter on was to us down here. It was to those that could understand it, and no doubt several of them probably did understand it even possibly better than we do today because they were in a sevenfold. They were a candlestick church. They had the sevenfold light. They knew what all these symbols meant. And so they got to look into the future. And some of them, no doubt, may die. Um, after the church fell away, they may die unjust and come up in a resurrection or just and come up in our just resurrection and finish out their course and possibly make the bride down here. Here in the fourth chapter, it says, after this, this is verse one, I looked, this is John talking, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter the future. So from the fourth chapter on, these people were given uh, the future of the Gentile world. It starts with uh, not only John seeing the restored church, which no doubt was very encouraging to him, but then seeing the seven seals, seeing the book was sealed up. And those seven seals actually is a, in summary form, the whole plan of God for the Gentiles from the day of Pentecost to the end. Just in very synoptic form, very, you know, just very summer, it was summarized very short. And then from the eighth chapter on, it goes into details that's in everything that's in those seven seals that's, that's in summary form. It's kind of like, Here's the index now from the eighth chapter on. Here's all the details of the book. Okay, let's continue. Let's go back now to uh, the fourth verse in chapter one of Revelations one. I hope that I'm, I wish you can, if you have my phone number, you could text me a question if you have one. Um, um, you know, if you have a question, you can text me. I don't think I, I might be able to see it. Let me look right here. Notifications. Um, yeah, I can see most of you, but then it goes into every notification that I have. So, um, I don't know that I'll get everybody's. Um, I don't know that I would get everybody's question that way. You probably need to, you know, if you text me, even if it's after, you know, I finish this Bible study, then you can go, um, you can text me and I can, I'll answer your text or question afterwards. Okay. Verse four, John to the seven churches, which are in, in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Here I will say where it says he's the first begotten of the dead, that's talking about the first begotten unto eternal life from the dead. Because there were several people, he even resurrected several people from the dead prior to himself. But this is talking about he was the first begotten, actually finished a complete birth into eternal life from the dead. 
um, and have made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Then it says, verse 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye will see him. They also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. Most of you have heard me talk about him coming in clouds. It's not talking about natural clouds. Clouds there is talking about a restored church. Um, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, in the first verse, it says, seeing that we be encompassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, talking about those in the 11th chapter that were faithful, that resurrected after Jesus's resurrection in Matthew 27, 52, that those, that was a cloud. That was a group of people in a heavenly place of the new covenant that, you know, it encompassed the people of God back there. And uh, then in the, in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations where uh, it shows the church fell away and the two witnesses, the Old and, two, Old and New Testament, lay dead in the streets for 1,260 years or three and a half religious, spiritual days prophetical days that equals 1260 years. Um, finally, those two witnesses that lay dead in the street stood up on their feet and they heard a voice that says, uh, come up hither and they ascended to God in a cloud. That's the restored church. Uh, clouds are not talking about natural clouds. I've I've read that right here where it says he's coming in a cloud and every eye will see him. Let's, let's, let's read that again. Verse seven, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so, amen. Remember when in Hosea that said, when they see him whom, whose side they pierced, God, after two days, is going to grab the Jews. That's 2,000-year days. 2,000 years, God's going to grab the Jew back in to the olive tree. Uh, I, I can go into greater detail about that later, but you've heard me on it. It's in Revelations 11. It won't happen, Paul said, until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The fullness of the Gentile, the iniquity of the Gentiles. God would can't add them back in until he has a ministry that can provoke them to jealousy. And that'll take a restored church. Uh, but they will come back in and they will be the ministry that at least initially leads out being ruled and reigned over by Jesus Christ and his bride during the millennium. Uh, but he's not coming. You know, I've used this illustration showing here's, here's something round like the earth is round. And I've shown, you know, I'm a pilot. I've, I've owned several planes and I've piloted from the East Coast to the West Coast and back many times. And so um, um, if you were out on the ocean, if you're up in the sky high enough, you can see the curvature of the earth. Of course, you'd be a little bitty plane. You don't have to be up too high. You'd be able to see its curve. But if you happen to be out on the ocean in a boat on a clear day, the natural eye can see seven miles at sea level. Sea level is the beginning of measurement of the altitude in the earth. So when you get to shore, the earth rises up above the sea. If it didn't, the sea would go over it. The sea would be wider. But the earth is a rise. And of course, when you get into the mountains like Denver, it's called Mile High City, 6,000 feet above sea level. So, um, so, but if you was at this, if you was on a boat, you could see seven miles. And when you look seven miles, you're actually looking at the curvature of the earth, seven miles. 
It's not very far up on here. And when you look that far, it looks like the sky is touching the water. <clears throat> That's because the curvature of the earth turns, the sky keeps, you know, the sky is behind it. So it looks like, and that's called a horizon. Well, I've said before, if Jesus came down to cloud level, the people on earth right here could, and seven miles away might see him. Same thing here, might see him. Maybe a little further if he's up higher, they might be able to see over the curvature where he was. But you wouldn't be able to see Jesus very far. You certainly couldn't see, see like, like, like let's say this is Arkansas. Jesus is coming back. He's certainly coming back to Little Rock, isn't he? <laughs> Not really. But over here, you might say this is California or maybe, uh, maybe if you looked even further, you know, maybe uh, Hawaii Islands. Uh, anyway, uh, then down here would be China. This would be Spain. Uh, you know, so every eye is not going to see him if he came literally down to cloud level. That wouldn't even make sense. So Jesus is not coming down. He's not coming on a cloudy day. I'm sorry if that's what you believe, but you're just going to have to change your, your way of thinking about that. Clouds in the Bible are symbolic and they refer to, in the 14th chapter, look what it says in the 14th chapter in the 14th verse. John said, I looked and saw one like unto the Son of Man uh, sitting on a cloud, having a golden crown on his head. That is the word of God, the, the, the wisdom of God's authority on his head of God's word, an unadulterated truth of God's word that was on his head that made him the head of the body. Um, the reason is gold. Uh, everything in the holy place was gold. Everything in the outer court was brass. Um, gold, they say, has to be 2,600 degrees to melt and get the impurities out of it, the dregs out of it, for it to be pure gold. Just a picture, John, Luke, wasn't it Luke that recorded that Jesus said in the 12th chapter, I think it's the 49th verse of Luke, where he said, "There is I didn't come to bring peace, but I came to bring fire on the earth. And he, then he said, there is a baptism that I must be baptized with else how shall I be straightened? Well, Jesus had to go through the fire. He had to go through trials and temptations. He had to be tested by God and by man. He could have, he was tempted. Uh, he had to overcome that temptation and go through the process. And he was doing that to show us what we've got to go through. First, we'd have to be born of God's nature then we would be like the first man, Adam, or like the last Adam, Christ, where we would have, we would be born of God, but we would be human. And therefore, we're like a tree of knowledge of good and evil. We can do either good or evil. Um, but we're, we're only to eat of the tree of life, which is Christ. And so... Uh, Jesus had to go through that, and that's how he was purified as gold. He said to us, Pur uh, buy me gold tried in the fire. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, uh, and verse 8 says, I'm the uh, uh, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, which was and uh, which is, which was and which is to come. Yes, he's coming. He's coming to the Gentile world, just like he came to the Jewish world. He'll come to us, manifest himself, harvest, bring up forth a complete harvest in the end of the Gentile world, just like he did the Jewish world. And he'll make up the remainder portion of his bride among the Gentiles in the end of the Gentile world, just like he did in the end of the Jewish world. 
Verse 9, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God, for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. That was on Sunday. That was the first day of the week. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. That means the beginning and the end. And what thou seest, write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, John said, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. In the midst of the golden candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. This was Jesus, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. See, that golden girdle was the word of God also that kept him girded up and uh, one place Peter said to gird up the loins of your mind. See, the word of God and the spirit of God can help you uh, to gird up uh, your loins where, and, and your mind where your focus is on the things of God and not on the things of the flesh. Um, his head and his hair were white like wool. Solomon said in Proverbs that uh, if a man obtained his white hair, uh, how do you say, with honor, see, it's a blessing to him. Well, Jesus, he, he was a young man at 33 and a half when he died, but when he got to heaven, he had hair like wool, white as wool. Uh, just a picture, symbolic, and white as snow, and his eyes was a flame of fire, and his feet like in the brass, See, he, he, he was out in the outer court suffering all that temptation going through a process of the outer court where the initial, uh, everything out there was brass and everything out there had to be offered up as a sacrifice on the brazen altar. And so, but his feet, his foundation went through that as if they burned in a furnace and his voice is a sound of many waters in his hand, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, that's the word of God, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. In other words, the sun, the bright sun, it, it depicts judgment, the heat from the sun. Uh, but in his right hand were seven stars. Now look what he says. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me and said, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I'm he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Now, I use these this, this statement here of hell and death, the keys of hell and death. If you remember, the pale horse was the fourth seal that was open. And there was a pale horse and the rider was death and hell followed with him. I stick with that same terminology, prophetical symbols inside this prophecy rather than trying to move outside of it. That hell there is talking about a religious hell and uh, that death is talking about while they're alive. Jesus had the death, the keys to get you out of both, to get you out of death that was hovering over you, that you were subject to death all your life and hell, a religious hell. God, the Lord sent Jesus here and gave him the keys to unlock that in every individual's life that would heed to him. Write, verse 10, 19, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. See, he's telling him, look, write, write what I'm gonna show you. Write what things that are right now that I'm gonna be telling these seven churches and the things that are gonna be hereafter, the future. 
Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. I wasn't talking about natural angels in heaven, third heaven angels. They don't need anybody to write them a letter. Number one, you couldn't, how would you mail it to them? But it's talking about these letters were seven, given to um, the, uh, the bishops or the pastors of those churches. Back then, uh, the man in charge of the church was called a bishop. He was a pastor, but there was more than one pastor. Some of those churches had thousands of people in them. Uh, you know, they were broken up in even house churches and pastors in every church. But there was a bishop that was over that work of all of those pastors that were helping them, elders in every city and every church. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. In other words, each one of those churches was called a candlestick church. In other words, they had in the holy place of the temple, there was a candlestick. Y'all have seen it. It's, it's a long stem and then it's got two stems come out here, two in the middle, two at the top. And in, in each end of each one of those stems was a bowl where olive oil was placed into and all those, those six and the one stem at the top, which was the seven lights, the sevenfold candlestick that was in the tabernacle and in the temple. And those, that candlestick was in, they were, those churches were called candlesticks because they, they had the sevenfold candlestick light from the holy place, which was a type of uh, the Garden of Eden, a type of uh, a sinless place, a relationship with God where where you could live, you were given power to live above sin. You had enough light, understanding, power of God to do that. And so that ends the, the first chapter. I intend to go through each chapter this way. It does get, it gets... Now, this first chapter may or may not have been interesting to you. And the introduction, you know, I just think it's necessary to go through that. Sometimes when you start a book, it's, it's a little bit boring sometimes to get started. And uh, I'm trying to make it as, in, in, uh, what would you say, as interesting as I can. But I'm not interested in, and doing it so evangelistic that you're not getting the points uh, and the information. And when we go through the second and third chapter, that is the seven candlesticks. I'll try to make that as important as I can, but I want you to know that is God's word to those seven churches and those people back there to prepare them for the final eternal judgment and wrath of God that's going to be poured out in the end of that world. And they, they didn't have a lot of time to come up with what was God asking them to come up with. But from the fourth chapter on showing the future, to me, it gets a lot of interesting, a lot more interesting. However, I think it's all interesting to me. But anyway, that's the introduction. That's the first chapter. Again, if you would, if you have the, well, if you have Zoom, and you want it, text me, and I will text you. Uh, you'll be able to see a picture of me like you're seeing today, but you'll also be able to see my computer screen. The video picture of me is small, but you can see me and hear me. You can see my mouse cursor going down every one of these words and going over it, and you would have it recorded. And uh, I'm going to do that on every chapter, so... The saints here, at least, and those that are getting this broadcast can, uh, they could receive that and get a video recording of me explaining the entire book of Revelations. Anyway, God bless all of you. Uh, let me say before we go home, remember again, Brother Ronald Goss is back in the hospital in Keswick, Ontario. He's just too unstable mentally. Um, 
for them to be able to keep him at home right now. So he had to go back to the hospital. Remember, Brother Bill Daniels, I'm asking God to heal that man. I'm asking you to pray with me to, that if it would fit in God's will, we're asking God for a miracle. I know Jesus can do that for us. And I, I would like to see Brother Daniels. He don't have to be sick necessarily like this. Um, you know, God can just take him in his sleep in perfect health. He don't have to go through a terrible sickness. I understand sometimes someone's final process, God takes them through fire. I understand that. That's why I'm saying, God, if it's your will, if it fit your will, would you give us this miracle and heal my brother? I'd like to see him healed. And so, uh, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's pray for him and pray for Sister Cindy, Michael and Cindy Smith's, Cindy's mother, Michael's step, uh, his mother-in-law. She's staying in their home right now with them. They're taking care of her. And she is uh, her heart condition. Let's pray uh, for her that God would touch her and help her and help Michael and Cindy in their endeavor to take care of her. Brother uh, Ray Weaver, Sister Susan Weaver, they need our prayers. Then we've got the Theory family that's new to us in our local assembly. Be praying for them. Uh, also for her brother, this nephew that she has taken that lost his mother to COVID. Uh, let's remember that child and that family. Um, also, Sister uh, Chesley uh, from the Russellville Assembly that due to circumstances that, and being what they are, she's... Uh, uh, in our church right now and we want to embrace her and help her as much as we can and I've talked to Brother Richie about that and he wants us to do that and be a help right now. Sometimes those things are necessary from sister church to sister church. So remember her and her children. Um, sister Crow. Sister Crow's doing much better but they thought we thought she was going to have to go to the hospital yesterday but she's doing much better the ambulance came out to her uh, to take her to the hospital, but the ambulance, the man in the ambulance told her, he said, I want you to know some things before you go to the hospital. Number one, they don't have any beds there. Number two, if you go to the emergency room, you're going to be sitting in there with patients that have COVID. And it will be four to six hours before anybody will see you. And after they see you, there's not any beds they can take you and put you in. So they could treat you possibly, send you home, or maybe if you're bad enough to another hospital in another state or another town, but they, they don't have any beds. So Sister Crow, of course, they checked her over and everything, and she was improved from the day before, but she she didn't go to the hospital. She stayed home. Her, her daughter stayed with her, Sister Judy, and she had a good night last night and her blood pressure and her heart rate was normal today and she's feeling much better. So thank God for that. All right, I'll see the rest of you Sunday. I know there's other prayers and things we need to mention. Pray for the body of Christ in whole. Uh, Brother and Sister Durham have been to uh, Springfield, her sister. Uh, lost her son this past week, 27 years old. No, he wasn't 27. It's, that was Sister Karen Boyd's son that got killed and died this week also. And so pray for Sister Karen Boyd and that family that lost their son. Pray for Brother and Sister Durham's grandson, uh, or Sister Durham's sister uh, and family. Uh, Sister Durham's mother, I know, is taking this very hard, and uh, her sisters, a whole family. Let's pray for them and comfort at this time. 
So remember these dire needs. Pray for uh, the Dominican Republic, the work over there, the work in, uh, I'm still praying for Brother Bud's works, the work in Brownsville, Mexico. We're praying that God will, will help those works uh, after losing <clears throat> a great leader like Brother John Bud. God bless all of you. I love you and I'll see you Sunday morning. Uh, also pray for our assembly and for this state, this COVID condition. Let's pray that God will help us to get beyond this and uh, that uh, we would finally get victory over this virus. It does look like that it is those that are not, you know, that are fearful about the vaccine, vaccination, <clears throat> which with all the propaganda, you can see why some people would be. And, uh, but it's those who are not taking it that are getting it with this new variant, this new Delta variant. <clears throat> all the hospitals and at children's, the younger generation are getting it too. And of course, Sister Hannah in our assembly works there and uh, there's no beds available there. They've had young children, 10, 12 years old, die with this COVID variant. <clears throat> it's serious, saints. So pray. Uh, and uh, you may want to go back to wearing masks and being careful. Anyway, God bless your hearts. I'll see you Sunday morning. Bible study at 9.30, breakfast at 10, church at 11.30, but church starts at 9.30, and breakfast downstairs. That's where we start with fellowship. Then we start with the word of God. Then we take a break, the band practices, and then we have worship service. It's all the same service. Some people are just two hours late when they get there. God bless your hearts. I'll see you Sunday. Bye-bye.